uh, for thank you for those of us who are joining online. If you want to come down, it's actually sal e, e not salset. Um, so I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Daniel Schneider. Uh, from Harvard, who will be speaking with us today about the work he's been doing. Just before we were to get started, um, this is part of a new um, research project that we're developing in the research department on labor compliance. Uh, one of the issues that uh, is very clear for anybody who studies the issue of labor compliance is that there's very little data out there uh, besides some limited labor force survey data on minimum wage compliance and working hours, many dimensions of working conditions can't be picked up by labor force surveys. So Professor Schneider has done some really fascinating work uh, in this area, which is why we're, we're thrilled to have him here. Um, professor Schneider is the Malcolm Weiner Professor of Social Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School, and he's a professor of sociology. Prior to joining Harvard, he was faculty member in the Department of Sociology at UC Berkeley and a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation postdoctoral scholar in health policy research at Berkeley UCSF. His research interests are focused on social demography, inequality in the family. His current research focuses on how precarious and unpredictable work schedules affect household economic security and worker and family health and well being. He is co director of the Shift Project. And along with his colleagues, they've developed an innovative method of data collection that is used to collect survey data on scheduling practices and well being from thousands of retail workers employed at large firms in the United States. So he'll be telling us about his methodology and his findings. And the floor is all yours. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks for having me. And thanks to you all for, for being here and joining here in the room or on Zoom. Uh, let me begin by sharing my screen. Terrific. Can, uh, if folks on Zoom can't see that, please just drop it in the chat and we'll we'll make it right. Um, great. Well, what I'm going to talk about today is in some sense a sort of summation of, of, of a number of strands of work that we've been doing at the Shift Project over the last few years. And much of this work is co-authored with Shift co-director Kristen Harknett, who's a professor at UC San Francisco. But some of it's also co-authored with many of our wonderful graduate students and pre-doctoral fellows and, and others on the project. Uh, I'll list them out at the end, but wanted to give credit up front as well. Um, as, as this group knows better than me, um, work has become more precarious over the past several decades, in the, especially in the United States, our area of focus. If, if there are places where bad jobs are better, as Tilly uh, and Carré have termed it in their book, maybe the US, and in particular the US service sector, is where bad jobs are worse driven by the forces of financialization, globalization, as a good Berkeley sociologist, neoliberalism it really transformed the world of work in America. It has led to what the political scientist Jacob Hacker has called a great risk shift from institutional actors to individual households and a resulting growing precarity and polarization in work. When we think about bad jobs in America, we often use the shorthand of low wage jobs and wages make a big difference. They matter a great deal. Uh, in some sense, though, wages have become the sole focus for many of those who are concerned with precarious work. You know, prominent scholars from you know, Paul Osterman to Vasco argue that income and wages are the key dimension of job quality. And in the U.S. academic world and policy world, we see this in, a, in, in really a, an overwhelming focus on the minimum wage, a crucial policy and one that really reflects this emphasis on wages as the key indicator of job quality. When you ask workers, when we ask workers, this is a little bit of a sneak preview of some results um, from the data collection enterprise that I'll discuss, what matters to you in a good job? We certainly see that wages, level of pay is a crucial dimension of a good job. That red bar shows that very large shares of workers report that that's essential, very important in a good job. And in the workers that we survey here, these are workers, hourly workers in service sector firms, they don't feel they're getting it. There's a big gap, but there's also a real priority on other dimensions of job quality among this very same set of workers. Benefits matter on the far left, but so too do predictable hours and the, and the, and the result of levels of pay and predictable hours, stable and predictable pay. And we see that for the, these dimensions of job quality well as well, there are significant gaps between what workers want in a job and what they feel they get in a job. This shouldn't be a surprise. 
for, for, for decades, for, for 100 years, the labor movement in the US and, and, and more broadly has advocated around work time, eight hours for work, eight hours for rest, eight hours for what we will. Um, where, where original, where early labor movements focused on the, a problem of overwork, of, of protecting time away from work, Research in sociology and economics and labor studies uh, emphasize the different aspect of job of the schedule quality of jobs, non-standard schedules, so night shifts and weekend shifts. This is the sort of when we when when the research literature talks about shift work, this is the shift work they often have in mind. And certainly, these kinds of non-standard schedules are bad for workers' health. They upset the sort of basic circadian rhythms of the human body and undermine sleep quality. Um, and so that's, that's an important aspect of job quality in the sort of temporal domain. For white collar workers, there's been real emphasis on flexibility, on flexible jobs, jobs where you might have the ability to work from home or control your own hours. What we wanna draw attention to, what really was the motivating uh, sort of agenda for the shift project when we began was a different kind of temporal aspect of job quality, um, that of schedules that appear to often be quite unstable and unpredictable. This, more than non-standard, more than uh, inflexible, more than overwork, is a, a problem that it seems overriding in, in retail work in the United States. Workers face schedules that are unstable that, and unpredictable. It vary from day to day and week to week in the number of hours and the timing of hours. And these schedules are often changed with little notice, where the control for this schedule variability lies with the employer rather than the worker. They are also inflexible as well as being unstable and unpredictable. And the workers who deal with these kinds of schedules, you know, in some sense should be top of mind for the public. They're always top of mind in this room, I know, but for the public they should be too, because these were the frontline heroes of the COVID-19 pandemic. These are pharmacy workers and grocery workers, delivery and fulfillment workers and food workers in the United States and around the world. Um, so when we think about what is a bad job, it's more than wages, and it's more than just a non-standard or an inflexible schedule. Instead, what a research literature has begun to elaborate, uh, building on the work of key scholars such as Susan Lambert at Chicago's SSA, um, are, are, are work schedules that appear unstable and unpredictable, where workers are expected to have open availability to work whenever needed, and then encounter real variation in the times of day and days of week that they work. We see this in specific labor practices like on-call shifts, which are well known, um, but also in last minute cancellations of shifts. When demand does not align perfectly with staffing, well then staffing is adjusted in order to constrain labor costs. Workers are sent home early or asked to stay late if things are busier than expected or has their shift canceled altogether. In all of this, we see the imperative to reduce labor costs in what are admittedly low margin industries. But labor is the place where that sort of maximization, that just in time, not supply chain management, but labor management plays out so acutely. This has been on the mind of American workers. Now for the last, you know, at least 10 years, there has been a real social movement around demanding more stable and predictable and sufficient hours. What we'll see is that hand in hand with unstable and unpredictable practices are insufficient hours. Workers not getting enough hours on their job. Um, and we have seen this, this social movement organizing, this increased policy attention um, play out in laws that have passed in cities and states around the country to regulate fair work week practices. In both these social movements and these laws, the target is large firms in the service sector. By service sector, meaning retail, food service, delivery, and fulfillment. These are the firms that have been targeted by workers like Walmart and Target. And these are also the firms that are expressly regulated by these laws, not the smaller firms that we often think of as providing some of the more precarious labor conditions. But there's a problem. And it's a problem in some sense that Janine alludes to more generally on understanding violations in the world that existing labor surveys in the United States really do a, a, a not a great job of measuring these unstable and unpredictable scheduling practices. Um, there has been some advancements recently with um, folks like Susan Lambert really working hard to get questions on these practices added to the NLSY, the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth, a cohort panel study, and to the General Social Survey. Um, but we lack fine-grained measures, and we especially lack this kind of measures in the same place as data that might help us understand the consequences of these scheduling practices on economic security, on workers' health and well-being, on child well-being, on economic mobility. 
And it's also unfortunately data that is not well suited in scale or specificity to understand the effects of workers' movements that might change firm practices or the effects of local laws that might regulate work scheduling. And then we might want this data like sort of all the time and right at once. We might want it fast and at large scale in an ongoing way. And so that is what we set out to try to solve as a problem when we started the project. Um, Kristen and I are, are demographers. Um, we are used to using large scale existing population data from high quality surveys. Um, and so when we got interested in this, we said, oh, great, we'll just use the CPS or the NLSY. And it was a real, I, I mean, profoundly uh, sort of unsettling to me that I couldn't just do that. Um, and I had to make a set of real compromises with myself that I'll describe to you to settle for data that wasn't that high quality population representative sample survey. And I'll describe what we have been able to make instead, but we think provides some value um, nevertheless. So what we have done at the SHIFT project is designed a survey that tries to sort of uh, do the following with these goals in mind. We wanna create detailed measures of workers' experiences that we can use to monitor change in working conditions in this sector over time, so a repeated cross-sectional design. We wanna use this data to inform state, local, and national labor standards, both inform policymakers about the extent of problems in the sector so that they can decide if they wanna take action, but also evaluate the effectiveness of these laws once put into place um, and the degree of compliance with these laws um, in the private sector. And then we want, also not just because these are the firms that are regulated by practices or because they are the firms that are targeted by workers, but we wanna understand the between firm variation in these practices in the sector. What we have seen increasingly in the sociology of inequality is a focus on moving past the role of occupational or industry segregation and explaining gaps to focusing on between employer segregation processes in generating inequality. It's that kind of between employer heterogeneity that we wanted to be able to illuminate in this study as well. There's an academic purpose. There's also a public purpose. When firms make announcements and get good press that they're gonna offer paid sick leave or raise wages, there is very little public accountability for whether firms actually do those things on the ground. And what we sought to do in the survey was to hear directly from the workers at large firms what they were experiencing as a way to understand what firms were really doing from the worker perspective. So to do this, we've set up the SHIFT project and essentially our approach has been to build a large scale survey that does the things I laid out but does so using a non-probability sampling design. Essentially, where can we find large samples of retail workers employed at specific firms and ask them all these detailed questions we wanna know the answers to? And the answer for us has been on the internet and more specifically through Facebook's advertising infrastructure. And so with Facebook, what we do is essentially support their core business, selling ads to people. And we leverage th that they're very good at that. They have more than just a way to reach people, they have a way to reach targeted groups of people. If I was uh, Verizon, the large wireless carrier, I might wanna target my ads to um, uh, young people in, the, in my coverage areas who have Android devices. And, and I could do that on Facebook. If I was the Shift Project, I'd wanna target my ads to workers at Walmart or Home Depot or Starbucks or McDonald's. And I can do that too we use the targeting infrastructure to make audiences in the lexicon of workers at these specific firms, one by one audience per firm. Um, and then we deliver ads to them as the survey recruitment device. So it is not a direct analog, but one way to think about this is that the audience creation tool um, in some sense is, or the, or the advertising platform is the sampling frame. And we are then building our, our, our target sample using these audiences. And then we're using the paid ads to recruit that sample to the survey. The ads look like this. Current or former Domino's pizza worker? Take a short survey and tell us about your job. Domino's is a maker of terrible pizza in the United States. But there are other terrible pizza makers also that we also target and there are people who make other uh, foods. Um, there's an image of somebody who looks like they might indeed work at Domino's. Uh, they have a red shirt on in this case, or they might be wearing a, uh, a blue and, and, and white smock if they were at, at, at Walmart. Um, and an invitation to take a survey. There's a prize-based incentive drawing here. Uh, there's a lot of questions, um, but I'll, I'll maybe we'll hold on those. I see them popping up in the chat. Um, workers who are interested can click on this ad and then they're taken out off of Facebook. There we cut the Facebook tie. We don't have the ability to tie respondents survey responses to data from, that Facebook collects on them and Facebook does not get our survey data in turn. 
Um, they're asked to consent to participate in the study. It's identified as a Harvard University study and then complete the survey. We have deployed this method now since fall of 2016. It's been a while. Wow. For my child's whole life. No, that's not the way to think about it. Um, um, to create a couple of different kinds of samples. The core of the data is in these yellow boxes that you probably can't see very well. That's our national sample. That is a sample of workers across the United States employed at one of about, I think it's 150 of the largest retail and food service firms. There's a rotating design. There's a core of about 30 firms that are always in that. And then the other 120 firms sort of cycle in and out so that we have repeated observations of them, but they're not gonna be in an every wave basically because of cost constraint. Then we also draw in the blue boxes targeted oversamples of workers in particular geographies. Um, uh, scholars of state and local policymaking in the United States will recognize Seattle, New York City, Oregon, New Jersey, Washington as progressive states that have passed progressive labor legislation. In Seattle, one of the first in the nation fair work week laws, as is the case for New York City and Oregon, but also these are states with paid sick leave laws, paid family and medical leave laws, and other labor standards that we're interested ultimately in estimating the effects of, and so want a targeted oversample of covered workers. And then finally, third in the green boxes, uh, we try to describe the embedded panel design for the survey. Workers who are recruited in the cross sections, so you read down the columns in the boxes with uh, uh, outlines around them, form baseline samples. And then we seek to re-interview these workers on a relatively short panel design, basically three to six months spacing for one to three re-interviews. Here, we're not using Facebook ads. Here, we've got people's emails and texts and, and cell phone numbers, and we're texting and emailing them, inviting them to re-complete the survey. So we essentially have, I think, right, actually now we're in the field with panel six. So six of these nested uh, short duration panels where we can chart workers' uh, mobility, both in job quality within jobs and mobility across jobs as they leave these jobs and even exit the sector. Think of this as sort of occupational cohorts in some sense. Um, so what do we get? Well, we get samples of workers employed at firms like these uh, employed. Essentially, it's, it's the mall. That's who's in our sample is the folks who work in the mall, uh, whether it be a suburban strip mall or the downtown area beset by chain stores. That's who's in the data in all. I guess it's more companies now. Great. I should know that. In all, we've collected data from about 200,000 hourly workers employed at 225 of the largest firms in the sec in these sectors. These, these are essentially the key subsectors in the data and some examples of some of the firms for whom we uh, 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 collect data on. The survey is very hard to keep short. I will confess. Um, we started with a real focus on unstable scheduling, but we quickly became interested and saw the urgency of many other topics. Some of these have joined the core of the survey, like paid sick leave um, uh, um, and wages. Um, others have become sort of timely modules. We collected a, a lot of data right at the beginning of COVID uh, and then through the, fir the, the first three years of the pandemic on workers' experiences of COVID safety and access to non-pharmaceutical interventions on the job, things like masking and social distancing and the ability to stay home when sick, on employer support for vaccination, um, on, on vaccination mandates, which never really happened in the United States. Um, we also have begun collecting quite detailed data on workers' experiences of surveillance on the job and automation. These are things like, is there a leaderboard at your job? Um, are you tracked in terms of your location around the store? There, are, I can talk more about this in the Q and A. There are obviously trade offs in terms of what workers know about surveillance and what and what they may not know. Um, but this is collecting some of the first data that we're aware of on workers' at least knowledge of surveillance and their experiences of automation, like self checkout or inventory RFID robots and the like in their establishments. Um, we collected some detailed data on paid family leave, and we're now collecting new data on workers' experiences of respect and harassment on the job as well as some data tied to the recent campaigns at Starbucks and Amazon on organizing and, um, and workers' interest in unions. Okay, so basically what we've done then is, is field these recruitment advertisements to collect this non-probability sample workers essentially spanning the period August 2016 through June 2023. Um, this is a funny way to collect data, and so I want to be upfront about what we're getting here. It, it is a, an extremely low response rate survey, if you want to calculate it in a, in a, in a traditional sense. We obtain, the, essentially, of those who see the ad, about 7% click through to see the survey. Of those, about 18% contribute data to the survey. So we're talking about about 1% of targeted users taking the survey. That's low. Um, this is not a probability sample. 
It's not a probability sample, both in terms of who we begin by trying to target, but it's also not a probability sample in terms of our, our non-response rate is really, really high. Um, so what do we do about that? What do we make of that in the data? I can talk much more about this, but what I'll say here briefly to try to not have you quit the Zoom at this point um, is to first, we can worry about our sampling frame. Um, who's really on Facebook and Instagram anymore? Everybody is the answer still, even though everyone intends to quit. Um, the data from Pew, which we think of as a pretty high quality polar in the United States, shows that very large shares of the working age population in the United States, upwards of 80%, remain regularly active on one of these two platforms. Some of that's a move to Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, so that's not everybody, but it's, it's really pretty good as sampling frames go. Um, what about this response bias? that many people are not clicking on ads. Who here clicks on ads that you're delivered on social media? All hands down, I understand. <laughs> um, so who is? Well, well, billions of people around the world, for sure, because Facebook is an extremely profitable company. Um, but second, who are those people? Are they selected in problematic ways? Could there be response bias on responding characteristics into the survey? And so one way to think about that is response bias on observables. And we can benchmark our data against a similar population of workers in current population survey or American community survey, you know, gold standard US population surveys. And what we see is that there is some bias in terms of the sample leaning female um, and leaning white compared to these workers. And we'll do post stratification and reweighting of the data to achieve the sort of demographics that we see for the industry, but not necessarily these specific firms. That's a interesting nuance, um, because there's very little firm level data in the United States to figure out who does work at these firms. Um, what about workers who, and, and we, we've done some comparisons, I should, uh, how, what do I should say? What, ab what about selection of the survey on unobservables? Maybe people who hate their jobs take our survey and tell us that their jobs stink. Or maybe people who are very trusting of their employers take our survey because they're not worried that the data is going to get back and they're going to be retaliated against. I think these are all really reasonable concerns. So one way to address that kind of issue is by comparison. So if that's the case, then that should bias key estimates in the data, right? We should be getting, that's the, that's the risk of the unobservables is they're a confounder. And so one thing we've done is to replicate estimates from our data against the estimates of associations and other data sets. So for instance, the wage returns to job tenure in the shift project look just like the wage returns to job tenure in the current population survey and the national longitudinal survey for these uh, populations. Does that mean that the effects of schedules on health would be the same? No, but I can't estimate that. That's why we collected this data, but it helps us get there. Another thing we've done is try to test for these confounders directly. And the way we've done that is instead of running that ad I showed you, we ran ads that said, hate your job at Walmart, take a short survey. And jobs that said, proud to work at Walmart, take a short survey. What we see when we recruit, and both those ads work pretty well, actually, uh, and when we recruit workers to it, we can then test to see if the key associations in our data look the same in those two different subsamples. So the haters are going to hate, 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 but do they? does the effect of schedules on their job quality differ from those who are proud to work at Walmart? And the answer is no. We don't see an interaction in the recruitment channel in that way. Does, again, does that mean you should always trust this data? No. But these are some of the things we've done to try to convince ourselves as good demographers and the rest of you as good social scientists and hopefully demographers um, that, that this is not a crazy thing to do. Uh, happy to talk more about this. Okay, but let's see what we learned. Um, so one of the first things we learned from the project was just how widespread exposure to schedule precarity is in the United States. Oh, I'm okay. I'm going to go faster. No, no, no. Right, I'm going to say less. Okay. Um, and, and what we see uh, really is that there is a lot of exposure to unstable and unpredictable schedules. Um, just a third of workers report receiving at least two weeks advance notice on what their work schedule will be. Another third get one to two weeks notice. And about a third of workers are getting less than a week's notice of their schedule. About 18% are getting less than 72 hours notice of when they'll be needed to work. But even once published, these schedules are subject to change. We see that about one in 10 workers reported at least one canceled shift in the last month. About 20% reported an on-call shift, at least one on-call shift in the last month. And two thirds of workers reported at least one last minute shift timing change, being asked to stay late or come in early or come in late or leave early and the like. We sum these all up. In some sense, we can get a sort of like extensive margin exposure to work scheduling instability. We see that about 20% of workers don't experience any of this stuff. They don't experience on-call shifts or canceled shifts or last minute timing changes. They get two weeks notice. They don't work clopenings. 
you close and then you open with a short, yeah, okay. Um, but it's all together, it's all together. Um, as I'll show you, the pandemic ends up not changing this at all. Um, yeah, um, I wanna emphasize that this, the, the F word comes up a lot in discussions of scheduling and uh, employers talk about flexible scheduling and it is for employers. Employers have a great degree of flexibility to deploy labor as needed. For workers, I wanna emphasize that this is instability. And I, I say that with some confidence because we ask them directly. In some sense, two thirds of workers say they have to keep their schedule open and available for work. They just have to be available whenever needed. And to get hired, you need to list your availability as open. Um, three quarters say their schedule is determined entirely or mostly by their employers. The starting times are determined mostly by my employer without my input. Um, and, two th and, and three quarters say they would either strongly agree or agree that they would like a more predictable schedule. These kinds of scheduling practices go hand in hand, as I mentioned before, with insufficient, I'm gonna skip this, okay. All right, so does it matter? Um, I, I remember a, a, a labor advocate that, that we were in, in this project told us that when, when she began her work, um, which was advancing fair work week laws around the country, uh, an in, someone from an industry trade group said to her, um, you've got a solution in search of a problem. Schedules are not a big deal to workers. It's just not, it's not an issue. You're, you're making a mountain out of a molehill. Um, with these laws. And, you know, that's ridiculous on its face, but as good social scientists, we have set out to prove the obvious. Um, and so what we have done is really try to estimate how exposure to these kinds of unstable and unusual schedules is associated with a host of worker and family outcomes. What I'm going to show you are just observational models. I'll show you a little bit of causal work at the end, hopefully, um, where we are predicting these outcomes as a function of uh, workers' exposure to unstable schedules, controlling for a whole host of uh, demographic and job quality characteristics, like controlling for wage and usual hours, and also in most models, controlling for state, year, and employer fixed effects. We're often going to be looking at the within employer estimate from these models, although there's pretty good reasons to not do that too. Um, it done, actually doesn't end up mattering all that much in these sorts of models. Um, what do we see? We see that a, whole, a number of important outcomes, baseline outcomes on quality of life, like material hardships and, and, and health and well-being, as I'll show you, are strongly patterned by the degree of exposure to work schedule instability and unpredictability. So here, what I'm showing you are predicted values from these models. We also do this with the panel data, showing that food hardships, not having enough to eat, going hungry because you didn't have enough to eat, residential hardships, like doubling up, deferring medical care, not paying utility bills are all significantly, well, listen, they're all significantly, they're high. They're just high across the board, regardless of your scheduling exposures for retail, hourly retail workers at large firms in the United States. Large shares of employed workers at big firms report going hungry because they didn't have enough to eat, right? So that, that's the first fact here. In general, in life, in life. Um, but that is even more so for the workers with the most unstable and unpredictable schedules. We see this too for um, distress, for sleep quality, um, for psychological distress. Workers with more unstable and unpredictable schedules report significantly higher, uh, significantly worse you know, well being by all these measures. Unstable schedules are causing economic hardship. That is certainly a pathway to these well being outcomes, but it's also profoundly unsettling of the rhythms of daily life. If you work at different times, including sometimes at night and sometimes not, uh, sometimes starting early and sometimes not, sometimes not working at all, it's hard to have a regular bedtime. Um, it's stressful to not know when and how much you will work. That lack of control, as we see, really gets under the skin and into your head. Um, it also generates a fair amount of work-life conflict. Here we're looking at work-life conflict. This, the, this paper really focused on variation by marital status, of which there is some um, for parents. But what I want to show you in general is if you just more like blur your eyes at this plot and see that each of these lines is, is, is increasing fairly significantly across the range of exposure to work schedule and stability. Um, we also look at consequences for kids. Um, and I'm going to not talk about these in great detail right now. OK, because I want to talk about this stuff. Um, but I'm happy to talk about that in Q&A. Um, so here's the question. Is this all inevitable? Is it a race to the bottom in the American labor market where in order to maintain competitive 
advantage and or just remain competitive with with other uh, other firms, you need to adopt these scheduling practices because this is the way to save on labor costs. This is the way towards profitability as a business. And, and some contend that's not true. I alluded to uh, Francois uh, and Chris's work earlier that there is a lot of variation even within these firms across countries. How about variation between firms within the US? And here, I think what we have shown, you can try to read the bottom, good luck. Um, but I'll tell you, it's not a secret, um, is that there's tremendous variation between firms in this broad subsector of the economy in these labor practices. That here's the share of workers who report on-call shifts by firm here. So we're aggregating up worker reports to get to firm level measures, essentially, right? Where we have really large samples of workers within each of these firms to have the ability. So we're not relying on like, you know, Joe and Wanda's reports. There's, you know, hundreds of Joes and Wanda's at each of these firms. Um, and what we see is that on the far left of the graph are firms where on-call shifts, for example, are really widespread. Who's over there? Family Dollar. Family Dollar. Family Dollar. Also, uh, 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 Dollar General. <laughs> but also Waffle House and Papa John's and Victoria's Secret and a number of firms across a number of different and within sector. Who's over on the right? This one you can probably guess without squinting at it. Costco, Trader Joe's, Whole Foods. Um, interestingly, Hobby Lobby. Well, that's the Christian one, right? That's the Christian one, right? <laughs> which is interesting, which is interesting. Chick-fil-A is also, uh, also comes out in some of these models. Yeah, this is aggregating up from our survey, essentially. Um, couldn't we get this from the firms? No, we cannot get this from the firms. Why not? Because they definitely won't tell us, but <laughs> also because they don't know is what I would put to you is that they actually have a very limited view into what workers are experiencing on the ground in many of these firms. Right. And we can talk more about that. Yeah. Um, so maybe what I'm showing you is that the, um, um, that the um, high, high basket value, uh, uh, big box stores are pretty good and like fast food and dollar stores are bad. But what I want to emphasize is that I need to drink some water. <laughs> <clears throat> What I want to emphasize is that there's a lot of variation. Uh, excuse me. Oh, what happened? Take your time. All right. We'll look at this. Lord. Feast your eyes. <laughs> yeah, we'll feast your eyes. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, maybe use the microphone. Uh -huh. Press the button on me. Can you hear me? Yeah. I sure. Uh, just for the slides of consequence, that you saw various things. Was that um, taking into account all the other covariates? Taking yeah, yeah, those are predicted this values from the model. Yeah, you got it. Um, okay, so there's also a lot of variation within subsectors. So this is just comparing among fast food employers in the United States on the on the share of workers with a canceled shift. And here too, you know, not as dramatic, but still pretty significant variation. Yeah, here is our friend Chick Fil A. Interestingly, here's Starbucks. What? Why would that? Aren't workers organized? Isn't Starbucks the place where workers are most upset? Well, this is an interesting phenomenon. In some sense, um, in many of these places, people exit. Um, at Starbucks, there is voice. And perhaps that's because, as, as our data shows pretty clearly, Starbucks is the is one of the least worst jobs, least bad job, you know, uh, uh, in this sector. It's, not, it's a good job, but it's one of the least bad jobs. Uh, skip this. And let's skip this. Okay. So, and I'm going to skip that. Okay. So, what we observe is a lot of variation in firms. Can we observe variation in fir within firms over time. What do I mean by that? I mean, can we observe change in firms over time? And in particular, if we can do that, um, that would be really powerful because we are often, when we try to go to estimate causal effects of these sorts of things, we're often leveraging changes in state and local laws. What if we could also leverage changes in company policies to estimate these effects? What if we could also honestly just observe if companies really did the thing they said they were going to do? So one of the motivations for our project that I didn't mention initially was when we started this work, Walmart had just an, uh, announced under pressure from United for Respect, then our Walmart uh, 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 worker advocacy group, that they were going to make a big change in scheduling. They were going to pilot a program that will give fixed shifts for associates who want stability. They will work the same hours each week, giving them a predictable paycheck. They'll know their schedule six months. What do we see? That a third of workers got two weeks, six months in advance. This was a big change. We were very eager to understand how this played out and then to leverage it to write very amazing papers. Okay, so fixed schedules will provide associates a consistent schedule that does not change for up to a year, said Corey Lundberg. Terrific. We said, well, let's just study this. We started our data collection studying just Walmart and Target. 
before and after the change of schedules and we quickly broadened our data set as you have seen here. Um, and here's what, here's what we found. Here's, unfortunately we have very, we have basically no pre-trend. We have a tiny little bit of pre-trend before this thing went into effect, uh, which is the red line. Here we're comparing Walmart, the share of workers who report having a variable schedule against basically a basket of comparable employers, large groceries and big box stores, Walmart's largest grocer in the country. You can see that nothing changed, that Walmart did not do this thing through December of 20. That essentially uh, Walmart is pretty good actually before relative to other employers, and they did not radically change their scheduling practices. We see that across a number of ways we might pick up this change in policy. Workers who would like more predictable hours, it's a little, little better at Walmart, doesn't change. So what happened? Well, they didn't do it, as you can see here. And then they came out later and said, well, we didn't do it. It was really hard to do. We couldn't figure it out. We piloted in North Carolina, but I don't know. It didn't really work. But then they said, but now, now we're really going to do it. Now it's serious. We said, okay, great. And so maybe they have is, is, the, is the answer. In our data, we now begin to see in the most, I, I forgot to bring this graph forward and I apologize. I actually don't know if it continues, but it'd be cool if it did. Um, that there is some, it does seem to be that there's been some improvement at Walmart in terms of the share of the variable schedule and the share who want more predictable hours. Yeah. <laughs> Mm, that's interesting. So part of it's about company size. Part of it may also be about establishment size. So maybe that if you're a super center with 250 workers versus a dollar general with one worker on staff, that, you know, the scheduling process is made easier. We see some of that, I think, in explaining the between company variation. We haven't formally done it. Um, Part of that I want to emphasize is a staffing choice. So Dollar General is choosing to have one person on staff. That That is part and parcel, I would say, the short staffing of this more general process of scheduling practices. Um, but we also, for instance, if you take Costco and Target, that is a world of difference in scheduling practices. And they are both gigantic establishments and gigantic companies. So it's not, I think it is probably part of the story, um, but it's not the whole story. I think part of the story on this between company variation and so you say, well, at Costco, people spend on average like $300 a transaction and they keep all the stuff on the pallets. Like it's really, a, it's a good business model and everyone pays you hundred dollars a year just to be able to shop at your store. Like amazing. So that's why they can do it. And yeah, that's, that's probably part of why they can do it. You say, well, in Hobby Lobby, they're very Christian and they have this commitment here, I guess, and also to other things. And when you say an Ikea, they're Nordic, but that's the, <laughs> that's the thing is all the high road companies are different in one way or another. They are all what's unhappy families, you know, yeah. Tolstoy quote here. Um, so what's notable then is that there has been a sort of broad based embrace of the idea that all firms ought to actually be doing better. Um, this is now maybe two years ago, the business roundtable, a major business group in the United States came out to sort of uh, distance themselves from shareholder value. Uh, ideology, which is it's pretty remarkable from this group. Um, and so I think part of what we want to see in our data is whether we actually see that playing out on the ground at all. For some of these large firms that have made the announcement or in the business roundtable, do we see change in schedules? And we might this might be the time to really see it, right? Because it has been a historically tight market, labor market in the United States. Oh. And um, I'm going to stop. Oh. And, um, and uh, we have certainly seen wages increase in this sector. Um, what we have not seen is any material change in work scheduling um, all through the pandemic and even now. I think in some sense, much more than wages, scheduling remains very deeply ingrained in the business practices of these companies. It is really hard for them to change their software. I've seen that up close working with one company, um, but just to change the basic way that that management works inside these firms, they just haven't done it. Okay, um, should I, I can stop or I can talk some about federal and state and local policy. What do you think makes I sense? I think you're more interesting. I think you should continue. <laughs> okay, so um, the US doesn't have any labor standards. No, um, but, but it doesn't have a lot um, in some sense. So, you know, there's the Fair Labor Standards Act as we all know well, it does not regulate this kind of work scheduling. It does regulate some aspects of work hours, but not, not this. And so at the federal level, uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren and Representative Rosa DeLora have been the key sponsors in the Senate and the House of the Schedules That Work Act, 
that would provide for more stable and predictable scheduling for workers. Um, it was introduced about two weeks ago. It's been introduced this time of year for the last uh, long number of years. Um, it's not, its prospects are not bright. Um, but what we have seen is a real movement to pass these sorts of scheduling laws at the state and local level, a kind of progressive federalism that we see very much embodied in minimum wage laws in the US and paid sick and paid family and medical leave laws. And some of these same states and cities have also been at the forefront of passing scheduling laws. Laws like Seattle's, New York's, Oregon, Chicago, Philadelphia, LA, all follow a pretty similar legislative template. They require that large employers in the service sector, healthcare and fulfillment in Chicago, mostly just fast food in New York, so some variation, provide at least 14 days notice of work schedules to workers. Um, that workers have a right to rest. They cannot be scheduled for a clopening shift. That is where you close and then you open with a fewer than 10 hour period in between. Um, and then they require that employers compensate workers when they have last minute timing changes or canceled shifts or on-call shifts. Not to say that they can't have those, but workers in some states have a right to decline them. And then if they work them to be compensated, think in some sense, the overtime model. Mm -hmm. Not It's not time and a half, but it's actually a much more complicated formula, but it's something like that. In Seattle, this law is enforced by the Office of Labor Standards. It's enforced by similar local labor enforcement agencies in New York, in San Francisco, um, uh, in Chicago. Um, they are by and large operating on complaint-based enforcement, although in, certainly in cities like Seattle, there is serious co-enforcement um, going on. That, that's really an important part of this. Um, there is very limited knowledge of the law among workers. Uh, when we surveyed them, about a third of covered workers knew about the law at all. Um, there's limited knowledge of the law among managers. Our colleague Susan Lambert, in her qualitative study of frontline managers, points to you know quite limited knowledge of how the, of, of the law's existence and let alone of how it works. And it's somewhat intricate. So our expectations of the effect of the law should be tempered, I would say. Um, we set out to estimate the effects using a very standard sort of difference in difference approach where we leveraged the shift data that we had collected as an oversample in Seattle before the law went into effect. This was part of the rapid response thing um, and after it went into effect and then creating comparison groups of workers in various different ways around the country from the shift project data in you know, everywhere else, in other cities with high minimum wage laws, um, because Seattle had that as well, um, in other cities that had considered or recently passed but not yet implemented fair work week laws in the counties around all different comparison groups. It doesn't matter which one we use. Um, and so let me show you, uh, this is the, and so these are, I should have talked about the comparison groups here. Um, so here, here is Seattle versus large cities with minimum wage above the federal. Um, and here are the impact estimates. What we see are that the law did seem to bring greater work schedule stability and predictability to covered workers in Seattle. Um, if we look at two weeks notice, the share of workers getting less than two weeks notice in Seattle declined by about 10 points. That's about a 20% increase in the share of workers getting two weeks notice. We also see reductions in the share of getting shift changes without extra pay, for instance, uh, or working on-call shifts. These changes do not reflect a city where there is full compliance with this law. Far from it. What and that shouldn't surprise us because it is emerged that it is, it is both there's limited knowledge of workers to bring complaints and they are in a precarious position to do so, limited knowledge of employers, and even in a city with a robust labor standards office, limited capacity to enforce the law, but it did move the needle on scheduling and doing so had important effects for workers' well-being. We see that, first of all, um, it, inc it, 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 uh, it increased workers' sleep quality. We've seen that result shown in other kinds of similar experiments. A field experiment with the GAP found this, and a, a smaller scale study in Emeryville focused on parents after the Fair Work Week Law also found this. Sleep effects seem to be one of the main sort of common outcomes across these studies. Um, this work continues. There has been efforts to pass similar laws in Connecticut and Colorado that have not succeeded. There was recently a campaign in LA that did succeed with the passage of a Los Angeles uh, uh, municipal law. Um, okay, so uh, the this Fair Work Week remains on the agenda. I'll, let me conclude here essentially and say that there's other work in process, including this last um, project that we'd be happy to talk more about on violations where we're trying to measure violations in a much more fine-grained way more broadly. Fair Work Week, but also paid sick, paid family leave in different states and FLSA, and to try to leverage that data um, to help guide strategic enforcement of local labor agencies. 
and I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank Sorry, you. I went so long. That was wonderful. Really fascinating, really important work that you and your colleagues have been doing. Does anybody have any questions? Sergey, and if you could use the microphone. Thanks. So what you did there was almost an IV, right? You you got the variation in the laws. You have the variation of the X variable and the Y variable. I mean, I just wanted to ask, did you actually do an IV? Because it's, it's your... On the, um, what you on showed was 90% of the IV the done. Well-being outcomes? Yeah. Um, the health and well-being outcomes also from the dip and dip. What we can instrument. Yeah. For, you, and, and we do, and that, that, that works well, too. Yeah. You instrument it using the laws. Yeah. The law is the instrument, which changes the scheduling, yeah. which changes yeah. the health and well-being. Yeah. Yeah. In theory, we can do that for all these laws. Right? So we've done it for Seattle. Um, because we had the contract with Seattle to do it. Um, but we have collected over samples in New York City, in Philadelphia, um, in in Oregon. And so what we're working on now is sort of pulling all that data together to try to, you know, have basically a multiple events study or you know, stack diff and diff essentially across all these city laws, which are all slightly different and okay, and have different coverage, but I think basically we can try to, you know, make that work all together and have more power. Uh, just two small questions. Uh, have you considered going beyond the US? Because with Facebook or Instagram, you could think it's feasible or uh, in your uh, investigation. And also when you concerning the, the charts, when you look at the, um, the impact of the degree of predictability on uh, on various outcomes, do you control for um, for individual characteristics such as uh, um, weight level of wages or whatever you can control for. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, so on the second question, yeah, we're, we're doing, we're trying to control for as much as we can, recognizing that there's lots we can't, you know, observe or control for in some sense, but we're controlling for a large set of demographics and we're controlling for workers' wages and household income and usual hours, union status, occupation, um, and so forth. Um, what's interesting in many of the models is that when we sort of do a horse race, just an association between the reasonable variation in wages that we see in the data, so sort of 725 American dollars to an hour to like 22, and the range of scheduling, the magnitudes of association with scheduling for things like sleep and psychological distress are much larger than the magnitudes over the wage rate. Now you could say, okay, that's because $22 remains a poverty wage in the United States. And I would say that's true. But in the world of the possible for service sector workers, schedule stability makes a much larger difference than even much larger wage gains than, than imagined by the minimum wage world. On the second question, I would like to do that. That would be great. Let's talk. <laughs> So I have a question about the link to Facebook sampling and how you actually break that link when you take data. So you, if I understand correctly, you have the sampling method with Facebook using their ads to identify people who work in those companies that you try to target, yeah. which would be based on what the user declared yeah. as being employed somewhere. I have on my profile, I work at the UN. Right, but, okay, so so there's a method that we can talk about more, and that of course comes with all the user information. Then the user clicks on your ad, yeah. and then you break that link. You don't collect the data from Facebook, but you rely on what now they said in the survey, where they again identify where they work and so on. Is there a reason why you break that link? And could it not be better to connect the two so to capture the data of the user who clicked on the ad and see how the 6.7% now work with what these users declared? And implied in the question is, how do you know this uh, Facebook is not selling you at least, at least partially data from the bots? Yes. Okay, so we, yeah, everything you said, that's how we find the workers on Facebook. And they click on this, and when they click on our ad, they leave Facebook and they go to harvard.qualtrics.com or whatever it is, which is an online 
survey platform, mm -hmm. right, that Harvard has a subscription to and where people run all their surveys through and at many universities also. The first question, basically just check, ask them, hey, where do you work? Um, and we ask again, and what we see is that everybody says they work at the place that we targeted them for working at. Um, and that makes a certain amount of sense. Could it be that workers, that random people see this ad and they say, oh, I want to win $500. I'll take a survey and say I work at Walmart. Obviously, I'm supposed to say I work at Walmart or whatever that was, Pizza Hut. Um, that could be. What we have done, though, is run these same ads that are not targeted. So we said working at Walmart, and we just sent it to the general population. Actually, I think we sent it to the population, like low income, like less than 50,000 household income. And nobody takes that ad. That ad does not work. It's not targeted to people for, who work at Walmart and people who don't work at Walmart. They don't take, they don't click on that. They don't take that. So I actually think we are getting workers who truly work at these places. Okay, wait, there was more to your question. Um, the link, why, why do you break the link? Why so we break the link, we break the link by going to Qualtrics. Why did we do that? Okay, I, we did that because when we started this project, they were doing this thing called Cambridge Analytica. Yeah. <laughs> and people were very upset, rightly. Okay, so um, so we just thought this is a bad idea. It's a privacy invasion. The IRB is not going to like it. It's potentially a data that I don't even want to have. Um, we're going to not try to connect these two data sources in any way, and so we don't. Now, could we? Could we go? Could we take our respondents and go to Facebook and say, can we have everybody's data on their friends and their likes and all that? And we could try that, but I think Facebook would say, no, you cannot have that. Age, gender. Age, gender. So we can see in the, and we ask age and gender so we could verify it. I guess I'm less worried that people are not giving us that correctly as we're getting a biased sample of people who give us the correct information in some sense. Um, yeah, is that helpful? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Julia. I have a, a number of questions, but the two that I'll focus on now are one was you had a slide that included a couple different sectors because mostly it's retail sales, it looked like, but then you also had a couple for hospitality, like hotels. And I would think the differences in the scheduling demands at hotels would be more different. And so I'm kind of curious about the different sectors and obviously in um, healthcare, pre and post pandemic, you would see a lot of difference. And I think what would also, I mean, obviously there's a lot of different things that would be super interesting, but in in the US health sector market, the difference between not-for-profit and for-profit health facilities would be super interesting. My, exactly, exactly. Um, and that's kind of linked to another set of questions that I was thinking about in terms of you know, how you recruit more people to participate in a sample. But I think the more interesting question I'd like to ask is the, um, when you see the data about the changes in the scheduling and you can see who the good employers are versus the bad employers, and it sounds like you've done some qualitative analysis with the employers, I would assume it'd be super interesting to know if they're not willing to give you data, are they willing to give you information about how they train mid and low level managers and like what their incentive policies are towards what is a good manager versus a bad manager and and all of that kind of information because obviously probably some colleagues from better work could speak to it much better than i who may be online but like what we do in in our the better work project and kind of training supervisors to not discriminate to do various things it would be very interesting to compare how that works across that spectrum. Because we all assume, you know, Trader Joe's, Whole Foods, the managers are told to be good managers, but is that like coming from corporate or not? So. Um, well, thank you. Um, but we should, we have less of it than the rest of it. I mean, they're in here, but we don't, we have not made them part of the core. I think we collected two waves of hospitality data, um, but I'd like to do that. We do see some between sector variation for sure. Fast food is particularly bad in the United States. Fast food is also highly franchised in the United States. And so that is something we are quite interested in as an explanatory variable. And we've been doing this horrible work to try to figure out who, which establishments 
So in our data, we ask people where they work. And then we also ask them, where do you exactly work? Like which McDonald's do you work at? Which Whole Foods do you work at? Like do you have a store number or a store name or an address or a phone number or anything. And then we scrape the universe of these stores from their store finder websites, or we buy the data from vendors who basically do the same thing. Um, and then we do this matching process to try to assign workers to individual establishments, which kind of works, but especially if they give us a store number, but all the other stuff is this horrible fuzzy matching. Anyway, uh, then what we do is we go to the franchise disclosure documents that all these companies have to file and we scrape them, the PDFs to get the universe of franchise establishments. And now the goal is to merge those things together to know who's franchised and who's not. Because that's my hunch of partly why, maybe it's store size, but partly why it looks so bad is it's this fissured and extractive, honestly, from the franchisee relationship by the franchisor to some extent. Okay, um, healthcare would be great to look at. We haven't done it. In some sense, we are resistant, not, not like ultimately resistant, but we are somewhat hesitant to just field the survey to another sector. Because the survey is very specific to these sectors, we think. And even has logic within it that, you know, don't target some questions to some sectors. So I think it'd be cool to go to healthcare and we could do it because healthcare has big employers that we need to do our sampling methodology, but we need someone who knows health. Yeah. Scheduling overtime and all that stuff. Yeah. In health, in, in nursing and, and yeah. And we could get really rich nursing home um, uh, and, and, you know, uh, ex extended care facility data. Mm -hmm. Of mortality and things and potentially connected that'd be really interesting but we haven't gone there but but we probably should um second question was to say briefly and i'll remember yeah. managers great yeah so i think part of what's going on here yeah no i got it yeah managers so um yeah so why are some places relatively good and other places kind of bad well you're right it probably flows through managers um and that flowing through managers could be reflected in a number of things so maybe the less training training thing is like hours budgets so hours budgets may just be more generous at some places than other places. And then workers are less in this sort of struggle of getting enough hours and managers are less in the struggle of trying to trim their hours and calibrate their hours exactly all the time that leads to just in time staffing. Um, so that's partly, so that, that is a difference in managerial practice but it may come more through like an hours allocation from district or corporate. Um, the other may be that managers are just you know, trained better or given different priorities. Um, What's interesting in the data is that we can look between firm and within firm. And a lot, I, I don't have the precise numbers at the top of my head, but some of the variation is between firm, but there's a lot of variation within firm. What's going on? How can that be? Doesn't Walmart just have a policy? Yeah, they have a policy, but then they have implementation in the stores and it varies widely. Not because I think managers are given different directives, but because managers are more or less skilled, uh, more or less uh, um, psychopaths, um, you know, all these sorts of things, right? Like you have a good manager or a bad manager. We do qualitative interviews with the workers that we subsample from this survey. And that's really what we hear from people is, oh, this manager I had at that Starbucks is great. But then I moved over here. And so that's, that's not a corporate policy, at least not directly. Mm -hmm. That's about manager variation. It points to training needs. We ran a module at one point targeted to managers. Lots of managers take this survey, right? In some sense, because everybody's a manager. But managers take it, and we ask them about these things, like how is your bonus defined, um, what is the policy on these different practices, and that is also data we haven't analyzed that much, but we should. <laughs> okay. But the have you measured? Is there any way to measure the productivity impacts or uh, of these changes? Because ultimately, you want to incentivize firms to sort of. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. So is there a business case for stable and predictable schedules? I'm not, so I guess what I wanna say is that I, I do not believe we should hang the argument for stable schedules on that. Um, basically, like I would just say that. So I'm somewhat conflicted then about getting into the business case, but we have, so what do we find? Okay, so what we well, the thing we can look at most clearly is turnover. And what's wild is that like firms do not publish any data on turnover in the United States. Would you like to know the turnover rate at Walmart? You cannot, like you cannot get it. And this is actually a big concern of like ESG investors who who have who do believe there is a business case. They're like, we just, if we could only know turnover. It's like, they just don't know it. It's wild. So we can estimate turnover in the sense that in the panel, we can 
So there's in, you can basically use indirect estimation the, from our friends in demography to do this by looking at the distribution of job tenure at companies. That has not gone that well when we try to do that. But we also have the panel data and we can look, in the cross-section data, we ask people, do you intend to find a new job? Right, so we can look at that. That's a very crude measure. And then in the panel data, we can look at actual turnover. And what we see is that more unstable and predictable schedules are very strongly associated with job leaving intention and actually leaving your job. They are not necessarily leaving to go to better jobs. In some sense, what it is is a poverty trap. Um, you can't sustain it. It sucks. You leave, but that doesn't mean that you now you go work at, you know, IBM. Um, that's not what we're seeing in in, in the data. How about for other? And, and that turnover result is is not just our data. A number of groups now have access to firm specific high quality administrative data like time clock and scheduling data. There's a study from nursing homes on this. There's a restaurant study. They all find that unstable scheduling leads to more turnover. We have a partnership, partnership. I'm not, we don't have partnerships, I guess. We have, we have work with IKEA um, USA um, where we all, we are doing a field experiment with them on schedule control and flex, real flexibility for workers. But part of that is that we have all their administrative data on time clock and scheduling and turnover and demographics. And we also estimate a very strong gradient. They, they actually have very stable schedules by and large, but among the share that doesn't, turnover is much higher. Um, we are looking at some of these KPIs. I learned what that meant recently. I'm very pleased with myself. I guess I can be in a business school now. Um, yeah. Key performance indicator. Um, and so and so we are interested in this. We don't have, I, I'm not gonna tell you what we find, but um, we are looking at that too. Okay, I'm gonna ask, oh, did you have a question or? Okay, I wanted to ask a question. And it's also, it builds on the questions that were asked by two people in the chat. So they're not being completely ignored. <laughs> um, you say you mentioned that you met that you worked a little bit with the city of Seattle. You mentioned yes. now this partnership with IKEA. I just wanted to find out a little bit about okay, so you you find these results. Do you then go to some of the firms? Do you then go to some of the local? What's the next step? Have you done that and has it been successful? Okay. Yeah. So so we write academic papers, but I think we have really and that's important to do. It's important to do for us, important to do for our students, important to do for the academic literature, but a lot of the focus of the project is honestly on not doing that. And instead on trying to find ways to um, not just like disseminate the work, but sort of learn in collaboration with these other kinds of organizations. And th there are a couple of different kinds. So so um, one, one set of people that we talk to a lot and we learn a lot from, and then I think who we can helpfully help inform our unions and labor ad advocates and worker advocates. So these are all labor groups like the Center for Popular Democracy and SIX. There are also like unions like SEIU, which you know, is very active in this sector. Mm -hmm. And we learn a lot from them about what pressing issues workers are ta talking to them about. And that informs our survey design. We also then try to you know, produce analyses that um, can inform their work. Sometimes those analyses are not what they want to see. Like Chipotle is not a bad employer in our data, but it has been a frequent SEIU target. Um, Waffle House is a terrible employer. The Union of Southern Service Workers is this public? I don't know. I'm going to stop. Okay. And then um, we also um, talk quite a bit to, so I'll give you another example of a group is um, there's a group called the ICC, ICCR, the Interfaith Consortium on Corporate Responsibility. Um, they're an investor group that tries to use their shareholder power. They would say it's better than me, but essentially to bring um, proxy votes and other things to companies. So who asked me about, oh, you asked me about firm policies. They train, it's impossible to get firms to tell you anything about what their official policies are, but ICCSR has been pressuring firms to release, asking firms as shareholders of the company to release information on their paid sick leave policies. And so our data can help there because we look at the share of workers who have paid sick leave by firm and how that has changed in response to actions like this. So at Olive Garden was pressured during the pandemic to provide paid sick leave um, by a muckraking journalist and it worked. They did, we see in our data, they did provide paid sick leave, fewer people work sick as a result. So we could also, so with ICCCR, we can, our data can inform them to try to just understand the basic lay of the land, who's offering paid sick and who's not, because we have no idea. And then we can hopefully estimate the effect of shareholder proxy votes down the line. Um, this is actually Janine's question. I should be looking at you. Um, uh, we also use the data quite a bit um, to try to inform local policy and legislation. So when Colorado is considering scheduling, they really need to know what share of workers in Colorado don't have two weeks notice. You're telling me what share of workers in the US don't have two weeks notice? Colorado is totally different. This is its own country. Say, is it, says every state and city. Um, does it vary a lot by place? No, it 
not. But it's really important that we can mine the data and because the samples are so large to say, this is what's happening in Colorado. This is what's happening in Connecticut. This is what's happening, not necessarily in LA because we get kind of small. So that's another way in which we deploy the data. Okay, great. Okay, so Shukti, Fabiola, and then I think we'll wrap it up. Okay. Very quickly, first of all, thanks a lot. And I think it's extremely important to do this kind of service with all the caveats around representativeness, et cetera. You do get some insights, which are, you know, we all kind of know, but it's different when you see the data. The two questions I wanted to ask were kind of asked by Jadine just now. The first one is from a slightly different perspective. Of course, the workers that you're looking at are kind of at the lower end, right? I mean, these are the more dispossessed at the lower end of the um, wage, um, whatever, you know. But I was just wondering, I mean, you have uh, come, states have certain laws, right? You know, Seattle has certain laws. But whether or not there's compliance also is something that you're trying to look at. And my question is, what is it that motivates certain companies to actually go in for compliance? Is it that, you know, they want to, look and sound better? Is it their corporate image? Or is it that these companies have a greater share of workers who are unionized, have a strong union collective power? So is it possible to find that link from your data? And the second question is, um, of course, you're talking about a lot of companies, and the companies might also be seeing this. Have any of them kind of provided any feedback? It's not that you're actively seeking it. But has there been any interest from at least the larger companies in this kind of, because, you know, it has very important uh, implications for worker satisfaction, et cetera. Yes, great questions. Thank you. Um, okay, so on the first question, right, there's this classic question in the enforcement literature, why complain? But you sort of turn it on its head, why comply? Um, and, and I think the first answer is because it's the law. Like, that may sound naive, but I do think to some extent there are managers and firms that like, oh, it's the law to provide paid sick leave. I'll I'll do it. Or two weeks notice, okay. Um, minimum wage, right? So I, I do I, I don't know the size of that effect, um, but it's it's not nothing. Um, I don't see these firms publicizing high road employment generally, voluntary or legal compliance narrowly. I just you just don't hear it that much, you know. Instead, I think the extent that firms try to get sort of like that kind of credit, it's for non-job quality action. So Target gets credit and then loses credit for introducing a gender-affirming children's clothing line or gender-neutral bathrooms. And these are, you know, by my normative principles, really excellent things to do. Unfortunately, they walk them back. But Target actually has pretty lousy scheduling practices. Um, and they don't talk about that, <laughs> um, but those that do don't necessarily talk about it either. I think the place where you have seen it to some extent is on minimum wages, where companies have voluntary minimum wages these days in the United States that are much higher than the minimum wages they face in many markets, and they proclaim that fairly loudly. And our data shows that, that they seem to do those things when they say they do. Um, so that's a piece of it. What, what explains the rest of the variation here and which firms do what? Honestly, what we are we are what we are moving towards is a, is a lot more focus on this question, and we are in the field right now with a new module asking about Fair Labor Standards Act violations much more specifically than we've been able to do before. So, you know, working off the clock and not getting reimbursed for uh, allowable expenses or illegal deductions or um, unfair pay practices and the like. And the hope with that, and this is work we're doing now with David Weil, who has been visiting the Kennedy School and was former Wage and Hour Director, is to um, administrator is to try to use that, um, those, those are not complaints, those are reports. So that is to say, we think less selective than the complaint process and to match that at the establishment level and then use a set of establishment level variables that we're building. So one of those is the franchise status, but you know, also industry, store size, um, sector, ownership of the company, um, anything we can get our hands on, local unemployment rates, competitive market structures, to try to predict compliance and non-compliance, but also then to use that to try to identify establishments that are at high probability of non-compliance so they can be investigated. Um, so I think that's getting us, I think that's in the similar spirit, it's sort of turning on its head, it's not why comply, but why not comply um, as that question. Remind me of the second question. Employer feedback. Employer feedback. Okay. So, so we don't, um, so we, you know, 
we don't work with the employers to get the data. I think that was clear, but sometimes people are like, so how did you get all these employers to do it? And like, we didn't. <laughs> um, um, and part of what we did is we, when we started, we actually tried to work with Walmart. We were like, oh, you're doing this great thing. Let's study it. And no, no. Um, well, sort of yes, 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 no. Okay. So then we sort of went out on our own. Um, so we sometimes hear from employers, not much, I'll say. One way we hear from employers was when we're actively running recruitment, the ads sometimes get shown to like executives because, mm -hmm. you know, it may be that the CEO of Best Buy is on Facebook. Um, and then sometimes we get emails from lawyers who are like, what are you doing? <laughs> and uh, we just tell them what we're doing. And honestly, that's kind of where it ends in all cases so far. Um, we are yet to get Harvard Council involved. Um, <laughs> The other time we've heard is sometimes when we get in the press enough, we'll um, companies get asked um, what what they think. So this is the company wage tracker. This thing we built with the Economic Policy Institute, uh, EPI, and this is taking our data. We are like we don't know anything about wages, but they do. Let's build this together. So um, this is a, a set of the large firms in our data, and you can ask it. This is a little out of date at this point. We need to update it. You know what share of workers get paid fifteen dollars an hour at Dollar General, less than 15. And you see that 92% get less than 15 at Dollar General and 89 at McDonald's. And where's a good one? Where's Costco? Uh, and less than 1%, like less than 15 at Costco. So they asked McDonald's, what do you think about this? And McDonald's said, that's not true. At McDonald's stores, we have a $12 an hour minimum wage. Okay, that's a very crafty answer because they're talking about company owned stores, which are less than 5% of McDonald's establishments in the United States, because they say we are not liable for what our franchises do. We have nothing to do with that at all, which is laughable. But, um, and so I, we have yet to have a company come out and say, that's not true, that our data, and in some ways that would be great. We have moved more and more towards just publishing company level metrics from the data. Um, in part because there's nothing else out there and we believe the data, but in part as an invitation to say, okay, so if you want to make more of your data available on job quality and you do so to refute us if we're wrong, great, let's do that. Let's let's have that conversation. And that has not happened. Okay, Fabiola, last question. I had two questions, but I think one was already kind of answered because this was on the side of compliance and and labor inspectorates. I guess we'll talk more about that later. Then my other question is, is it was also about behavior. Um, I think it's a great project to be able to collect all this data and shed light on something that is very difficult, but have you had encountered evidence on your data being used for the wrong ways? You know what I mean? Like yeah. trying to show light on something, but actually can backlash workers feeling retaliation or when you follow up with them, uh, kind of the unintended consequences of this project somehow? Thanks. Yeah, it's a very good question. I mean, I think we, we worry about data privacy quite a bit. Um, and what if the data was got out in a way that an individual worker at somebody's McDonald's franchise could be identified and then experience retaliation? So we have pretty serious data controls in place and it you know lives in a secure environment and we don't have much identifying information. We have people's email address and cell phone. We don't have their name or date of birth or SSN. In some ways, it's sad. We can't link it to anything. Mm -hmm. I'd love to link this to voter files or, you know, that would be amazing. We can't do any of that stuff. But but good, because it's more secure. Um, it has complicated our efforts to make the data public, I think, because what's cool about the data is that it's got employer, but that's also what makes me somewhat nervous about the data. So that's something we're still working through. Um, has the data been sort of like, twisted not that i have seen um not that i have seen particularly um yeah yeah thank you okay. okay so we are past the time but that's okay because it's been really riveting and you can see there's still many people on oh, the... have abandoned us that have not abandoned us um, yeah, I think I think we're going to end it. Uh, Isabella, I'll send, I'll share your your question with with Danny, and uh, thank you everybody for listening, and have a good rest of the day. Thank you so much.